Hello, everyone. This is Culture Comms and Cocktails, internal comms served straight up. I'm your host, Chuck Go, Senior Strategic Advisor at Social Chorus. And on this episode of Culture Comms and Cocktails, we have Paul Bothus, Director of Communications at Nebraska Medicine. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. We'll grab a seat here at the Cocktails Lounge. Let's get started. Uh, first off, Paul, when we get into this in this weird time we're all in, how are you and the team at Nebraska Medicine doing during this health crisis? Um, you know, we're doing, we're doing well. And, and thank you for asking. I think it's one of, the, one of the things we can look to as a positive from this whole thing is, is I think maybe we're checking up on each other a little bit more and asking that, you know, how you doing, especially in healthcare. I feel like I've been hearing that more and more, but, but we're doing well. I think, you know, our, our health system felt pretty well prepared and pretty well trained for this, which, you know, is not to say that we had all the answers going in because clearly nobody did. Um, but we're also fortunate that right now the state of Nebraska hasn't seen the volume of um, sickness that other parts of the country have seen. Um, but, you know, we, we, we don't think we've hit our peak yet either. So we're still, we're still anticipating things will get busier in the weeks ahead. But, but we're, um, I feel like the team is holding up pretty well in, in the communications department where I work. We've been, we've been at this pretty much nonstop since early February. Um, Nebraska was one of the very first areas um, to respond to the, the coronavirus um, outbreak. And we had a number of people who came from the cruise ship who were quarantined here. Um, and, and so we had a significant role to play in that. And so the communications have been ongoing for quite some time here for us. So it's been an around the clock job, but it's, it can be rewarding at times because we know the work we're doing matters. People are looking to us for information and being able to provide that is, you know, it's why you get into communications. And, and you and the people you care about doing okay? We are. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting time. I have, I have a, a son who's a freshman in college and one who's a senior in high school. And so one just moved out One's you know, high school senior year just abruptly mm. ended. Um, but uh, everybody's doing well. And, and I think um, that fortunate nature of our situation isn't lost on us because we know, you know, we see the hardship around that other people are going. So as, as in the same breath that I'm saying, our team's been working nonstop for, you know, a couple of months now, that's not a complaint. We're, we're grateful that we have the opportunity to do that because we know so many people have been negatively impacted um, and, and really abruptly um, by the economic fallout of this on top of the concern for their health and well-being. Yeah, I saw some great advice that if a manager goes to an employee and asks how you're doing and they say, okay, don't take that as the answer. Mm -hmm. Like dig deeper because nobody's really doing just, I mean, we're all probably just doing okay, but we're all trying to get better during all this. Yeah, we, we actually had, and one of the things I'll talk about is our, our um, regular town hall forums that we've been doing with our employees and our, our colleagues, our physicians, and um, really anybody who works here and wants to listen, we're doing these every week. But one of the, one of the things we've been trying to pay attention to each week is that, um, you know, just the well-being component of it and not just talking about, well, the symptoms are this, the latest research shows this. It's really that, how are you doing? Um, and, and we had the uh, director of behavioral health come and speak a couple weeks ago. And as he was, um, you know, going through like, these are normal reactions to a crisis like this. You might, you might this. And I'm sitting there going as the person who helps coordinate that meeting, I'm sitting there going like, Ooh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Like it's, you know, I'm not providing patient care, but um, you feel that stress no matter what. And you don't have to work in healthcare to feel that stress, you know, mm -hmm. just everybody's, everybody feels it to some degree, I think. Um, and everybody looks forward to <laughs> when it starts to ramp down and then hopefully at some point in the near future goes away. Yeah, I thought it was, in, you said that you and your team have been working on this since early February. I think that might be a little bit surprising, but also comforting to a lot of people. Because for a lot of us, the impact of this, we didn't really feel it until about mid-March. Uh, so since that time, and you know, February, I know you guys are probably used to 
different crises in different ways. One thing I'm curious about is how do you manage communicating and prepping during a crisis, communicating during a crisis, but also communicating kind of the normal things as operating as a business during all that time? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And honestly, we've, you know, you, you, you struggle with that because it, we, we had one of those forums just yesterday and our chief operating officer was saying, you know, the, the ratio of coronavirus patients versus non-coronavirus patients who we're caring for in our hospitals and clinics, it's, there are a lot more, quote, regular patients out there than there are COVID patients. The COVID stuff obviously takes up a lot of the oxygen because it's such an impact on um, the entire operation from, you know, every corner of what we do has been impacted by it. And again, that's true for, you don't have to be in healthcare for that. That's true for a lot of places. But we've really tried to not lose sight of the other stuff that people count on us to do. You know, there, there's still people who are um, unfortunately being diagnosed with cancer. There are still people who are having strokes. Mm -hmm. And we actually shared a story um, just this week of uh, our the first pediatric uh, CAR T cell patient, uh, which is a, a very cutting edge cancer treatment. Um, first one in the state, is, she's a you know, very young child, went home from the hospital. That was a huge, that was a huge, um, obviously for that family, but you know, progression in, in, in cancer care. And that this is now, you know, available here in our state for children, young children, and nothing to do with coronavirus. And when we put that out on our social media, you know, the, the response from people, not just affiliated with us, but just regular people is like, oh, what a, you know, great thing to see. And people are, are thirsty for those good news stories that, that don't necessarily tie directly in with the, with the COVID outbreak. Now, when you're uh, giving these updates to employees, another thing I'm curious about is who is the best spokesperson? You had mentioned your director of uh, behavioral health was one person who came up and spoke, mm -hmm. but who are you putting out in front to update employees and comfort employees during this time? The, um, Consistent voices that we've had at all those forums, and this is this is true externally as well. Um, our CEO just so happens to be a great communicator. He also happens to be a pathologist by background, um, so it's really helpful when um, conversations about um, you know, how lab tests for coronavirus works. He knows the answer to that question. We also have um, our our pathology chair who contributes, but the other consistent. Um, voice is the director of our division of infectious diseases who also directs the hospital's epidemiology or uh, excuse me um, infection control program and then the executive director of biopreparedness who's a nurse by background and the two of them are as knowledgeable as you'll find they're as comfortable talking to anderson cooper on cnn as they are talking to employees in the room or um, like we're doing here over video conference. And the, the ability to speak in terms that people understand and to have a message of reassurance is, is one of the nuances. And, and my colleagues who work in healthcare communications can probably attest to the fact that it's not a skill that everybody has, you know? Um, Physicians are often used to speaking to other physicians or med students or scientific peers. And not everybody has a gift for speaking in a way that everybody can understand. And just because we work in healthcare does not mean that we all have a science background. So one of the things that um, both of those people, and I should call them out by name, Mark Rupp is, a, is the physician who's in charge of infectious diseases and Shelley Sweethelm is our uh, executive director of biopreparedness. And um, there's a good chance you've seen them or read some quotes from them because they're very active and both really understand the importance of communication in a time like this. It's really built into all of the um, preparedness drills and plans built into the, the DNA of the organization that you can't have a um, pandemic response and tell your 
PR and communications people to you know go wait in the corner. It's not going to work because people. I mean, we're seeing that now that people have a real thirst for information. And the old adage in in public relations about you know you got to fill in those those gaps or they'll fill in themselves. And and mm -hmm. where there is a, a vacuum of information, it will get filled with something. And it may be from you know maybe from Twitter. It may be from you know the conspiracy theorists down the street. Um, so we have a we have a responsibility we feel like to 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 help educate people with what we know. So that's my long answer is saying we we're we're really fortunate that we have experts in this field in public health, in infectious diseases who also just so happen to be great communicators. There's another member of the infectious diseases faculty who um, has been a regular contributor. We've been doing um, weekly Facebook live interviews with a member of our communications team interviews um, physician we're taking questions that are coming in from um, from the public and you know the information changes week to week so it's really important not to just have well we did that you know back on March 3rd mm -hmm. well, the information today is way different um, that's how, how quickly this is changing so having somebody there who is conversational but also very knowledgeable we had just we did one of those um, this week and, and uh, a reporter in town said you know, Dr. Cawcutt is like, he's kind of like your neighbor, but really, really well-educated neighbor. Like, <laughs> that's the, that's the music to a healthcare communicator's ears because it's somebody who's approachable. You're, you know, talking to them over the fence in your backyard, but also happens to have an advanced degree and, and done a ton of research in infectious diseases. So they know what they're talking about. And that's a, a great segue to my next question. So how do you deal with conflicting information and either conflicting because what was different yesterday is different from today versus stuff that's just inaccurate out there. Because I was thinking about it from a standpoint, you have a lot of employees there who are healthcare professionals. You also have a lot of employees who work in healthcare, but they do not have a healthcare background there. So how do you, there you go. So how do you keep people up to date with the most accurate information, knowing that the communities that they are a part of might be looking to them for answers because they know where they work and what they're a part of. Yeah. It's one of the things when, um, to, to backtrack a little bit, Nebraska medicine was one of the, the few healthcare systems that was involved in the Ebola response five and a half years ago now. And so one of the things I, I would talk about after that experience was no matter how big your PR team is, your PR team is your whole organization, whether you know it or not, because that hypothetical conversation between neighbors over the fence in the backyard or while you're going to the mailbox or whatever, you may not be a, a communicator by background, but if your neighbor knows you work at the hospital, they might say, hey, what's really going on over there? Do I need to be mm -hmm. worried about this? And if the answer is, yeah, I don't know. I don't, they don't tell me anything. I don't know. That's not a good answer. And that's not, you know, you amplify that times, times how many people. So, so we, um, we have a, a number of channels that we use to communicate regularly with our staff, understanding that everybody absorbs information differently. We're, we're actively looking at um, <laughs> changing things up, but not right now. It's not a great time to change things up right now. Um, so we, we're doing um, these, these weekly forums that had been monthly. We accelerated that cadence to weekly. Um, and it's a 90 minute meeting once a week. It's led by our CEO. Our entire senior leadership team is present. And then also our, you know, our physician and buyer preparedness experts are part of that. The biggest part of that forum is taking questions. It's Q and A. So we encourage people to submit ahead of time. We encourage people to use the Q&A function here within the video conferencing system. And um, I'm sort of like an octopus uh, reading questions. And, and I've got a member of, uh, of our department who's, who's helping, you know, triage those questions and sort them out and, and um, asking questions of our um, HR leadership team, our nursing leadership, our infectious diseases team. Um, and a lot of those questions are, hey, I heard that. Is this true? You know, one of the one of the regular things that we've been getting was the, the you know, the controversy or questions around the hydroxychloroquine thing, which has been a national story. And 
And the answer from our infectious diseases team is, we don't know. It needs to be investigated. We can't mm -hmm. say for sure it doesn't work, or we can't say for sure that it does. As scientists, you have to investigate it. And so that helps people sort that out and kind of cut through the, um, you know, the controversy around some of those things. Now, some of the other stuff they can say for sure, that is not true. Or, mm -hmm. yes, there is, some, there is something there, and it, and it um, warrants further investigation. But between the, daily, the weekly form, we also do a daily e-newsletter that is, it's basically a blog format. We, we push it out by email and it's hosted on the front page of our intranet. So um, in theory, every day when somebody logs in, they're seeing the three or four top stories. They have the ability to ask questions or post comments. Um, and then, you know, people answer those questions there for, for everyone else to see. Which yeah, I think about it. It was the other evening I watched a little bit of a, a town hall that CNN did and people can mm -hmm. submit questions. And I was thinking about it the same way that if employees were submitting questions and they were very basic, you could tell they were asking out of insecurity and fear mm -hmm. and unknown and looking for assurances. And I can imagine that that's happened across every organization and every company if people are being given the opportunity to ask those questions, or if there's even people to give those answers to people. Yeah. And that's, that's the, um, that's the value I think in those meetings is having that interaction. And I always tell people our organization is like a small city and in Nebraska, it's kind of a medium sized city. You know, it's bigger than a <laughs> lot of cities in Nebraska. We have, we have 8,000 employees plus on our health system. And then um, the university, our academic partner, which is sort of our, our, uh, our sibling and all of this, we're separate organizations, but we're really the same um, altogether, the med school and, and all of the, um, the other uh, health sciences, education and research functions. You know, we total this all up. It's you're pushing 13,000 people. Um, that's a small city, right? And so you have people of all different backgrounds and um, education levels and, um, you know, not everybody wears a white coat with a stethoscope around their neck. Many do, but not everybody. And not everybody has time to stay up on the news. So if they're catching, um, you know, fragments of stories, well, I heard this and I heard that, um, what better way to get an answer to that than to ask the person who's, you know, the chief of that um, division mm -hmm. and say, I heard that this is a, you know, biological weapon that escaped from a lab. Is that true? And he can say, Categorically, that is not true. It's been researched. The genome has been sequenced. It's not true. Mm -hmm. And you get a, a succinct answer like that, it really helps build confidence. You had mentioned some of your the organization's past experience with Ebola. From a healthcare communication standpoint, not the medicine, the communication yeah. side of it, how different is this crisis than others like how much has it impacted you and the team there than other crises have we we said early on my uh my media relations uh colleague and me who who was um he and i were side by side on ebola as well with with the rest of our team but um um this is this uh, media relations guy is sort of the, the frontline contact for everybody so um early on he's like this is going to be way more than ebola um, the, I think the biggest difference is this impacts everybody. Um, the Ebola response was exceedingly newsworthy, but you were never going to catch Ebola at the movie theater or at the mall. Mm -hmm. This is different. That's a possibility here. Um, and I think people realizing it is, um, it changes the face of how we communicate. Um, just, yeah, you know, it, it just, uh, that's the biggest thing that it's, that it really is a global pandemic. I mean, the Ebola thing was a global pandemic and that it, 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 it impacted concentrated pockets of certain areas, but there were never more than, you know, a couple, three or four Ebola patients in the U S at a time. And they were mm -hmm. in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a different, this is a different disease. So that was one of the things we were, um, we were consciously communicating early on. However, the core um, tenets of our communication policy was largely the same in that, you know, 
when when somebody calls, a reporter calls, or an employee has a question, you answer them. You 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 be as forthcoming as you're able to be because people need to know. People want to know. And like I said earlier, communications is a is a key part of a response to a an epidemic, a pandemic, because um, lack of information leads to lack of security, I think. And, and the more we can share with people what's really going on, um, the better they'll be able to make decisions for their, for their, their own lives and their families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see it across organizations, whether healthcare related or not, seeing communicators really step up and be that trusted source or putting trusted sources out there. And it goes back to a previous episode I had with Tamara Rodman from Edelman on where they did a specific study around trust in COVID-19 information. And it said employer comms were the most trusted source of information. That's where people go for the updates. And that's, that's a really good point because one of the, you know, we, we would get um, invitations to speak at communications conferences over the year. In fact, I was in Chicago in November speaking at a conference about, about Ebola response, our, our experience there. And I was thinking like, this information's kind of old. I mean, it's five years old now. And, and um, I really need to work on some, <laughs> getting some new, uh, <laughs> new material, but you know, some new perspectives on this. So if, if in any way I caused any of this, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but, but I think back to the point was when you go to those conferences, it's not just hospital communicators who are there. It's, public schools. It's, you know, there was a, a, a public library system who was present at this conference. And, and the point that I always tried to make was that the Ebola is an example. You're not, you're not going to get it. Even if you're in healthcare, the chances of you getting an Ebola patient walking your door, very, very slim. Something else could happen though. And, mm-hmm. and um, so pay attention to the core. And it, it's, it's, it's most of it is just common sense and logic, but those those core beliefs and tenets of communication will serve you well, whether you are um, a construction company, whether you're a, a large hospital system or a small community clinic, or you're a public school, you know, there's a crisis that keeps you up at night. So I was, always try to leave people with some homework from those conferences. Like when you leave here, think about what's the crisis that gives you the night sweats. Mm-hmm. And then go back and talk to your boss and say, how are we prepared for a IT breach, a security breach, a bad guy with a gun, uh, a water leak, you know, something. What is it that keeps you up at night and how do you respond to that? And it doesn't have to be a huge three ring binder full of here's what we're going to do. It could be a one page outline of like, if this, then this. And I think um, a lot of people have, learned hopefully not the hard way but through the last several months that um a crisis plan is very necessary yeah i've i've joked with a few communicators that there were probably a lot of crisis plans dusted off during this when they opened the first page it probably had fax numbers on it mm-hmm. of what to use it so few people yeah. look at those and keep those up to date well and i think you know maybe one of the other positive outcomes of this whole thing when when it starts to settle down a little bit is the importance of practicing. And I go back to, so I've been with Nebraska Med for uh, a little over 12 years now. And from the very beginning, uh, our communications and media relations teams were brought in on drills for our biocontainment mm-hmm. unit, for IT security. We did facilities drills of, you know, what, what would happen if we had a pipe break or the air conditioning quit Mm-hmm. in this part of the building? How would we move patients to another part of the building? How would we communicate that? Um, doing those tabletop drills or actual in the unit drills is incredibly important and valuable because when it actually happens and it will, some, some form of something's gonna happen at some point, you will have some perspective on how to respond, who will help you respond, who in your leadership team or who in your facilities team or your IT department, who's, who is that conduit to get the information you need as a communicator um, to, to tell people what they need to know. Those drills are vitally important. And I hope people will, um, 
if they don't, if their communications folks don't have a seat at the table during those, I would strongly encourage them to um, find a way to get a seat because um, it matters. And like you said, whether you're in healthcare or something else, this is a largely a, a healthcare driven um, crisis, but it's affecting everybody, mm -hmm. healthcare or not. So we all have to be ready. One thing I would like a little bit of clarity on my own part, uh, this next question, I've seen some controversy around this, around employees sharing their like stories on their, on their personal social media. So you talked about, you know, there's a person across the fence, their neighbor asked them a question yeah. and then they, they give them an, an answer that might be the accurate one or might be a man, I don't know what's happening. And I'm not saying this happened at Nebraska Med, yeah. but just as, as an expert in the field, have you given advice to employees around social, like what, is it just a reinforcement of what the existing policy was or was there a change to say, look, we have to be a little more careful because there are more eyes on what mm -hmm. we're doing. Yeah, we've, in fact, I was just, um, I was trading emails on this very subject with somebody just yesterday um, asking for some, uh, some clarification. And um, we've really just, like you said, we've just doubled down on our, our existing policy, which is really rooted in, no photos, no video in patient care areas where somebody's um, identity or uh, personal health information could be visible or could be revealed. That is it. An and that's how it is every day there. I every day, imagine. right, exactly. Yeah, that's, right. Not, that's not something special. And that's, that was one of the things that we wanted to say that, you know, just because we're in the middle of this very high profile crisis and everybody is, um, we're not deviating from that, that core message. Now, also, part of our policy doesn't include what people can say on Twitter or what people can say on Facebook. We're not saying you have to say nice things about the organization. Um, with, with this many people working here, it's just, it's, we wouldn't dream of trying to police what everybody says, but also it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And so, Again, back to the transparency of communication, we hope that we're doing a good enough job that when people um, take to their personal Instagram or Twitter account or whatever, um, they can relay the information that they're getting right from those reliable sources, those decision makers, and there's, there isn't ambiguity. Um, now, it's not to say that there may be some employees out there who are saying um, bad things about uh, about work right now um it's it's a stressful time i understand it but um largely we yeah to, to answer the question we largely have not ad adapted our social media um policy in any way one of the things that you know we did um we have been approached by um some news organizations and others about having people do video diaries on the front lines, you know, in the emergency department, in the ICU. And we have decided to say thanks, but no thanks to that. Um, and I know other hospitals have done it and have provided very valuable perspective from those front lines to help people see what's really going on. And, and this isn't to say that they've made a, a bad decision in doing that. I think, again, that, that perspective is very valuable for us. We just, we sort of weighed the pros and cons and said, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that at this point. Now, some people, again, there may be people doing that on their own, and we just have to trust that they're following the policy that um, has been, you know, shared with them and um, is part of the core of being a healthcare professional is that you don't do anything that's going to jeopardize the the privacy of your patients. So, there are probably people who are sharing their experiences from the front lines privately. Um, but we're just, you know, we're, we're counting on the fact that they're not revealing any private information when they're doing that. Well, when we kicked this off, we talked about one good thing coming out of this is people checking in on each other. Uh, the other good thing is people showing appreciation for those on the front line. So from, from me and the social chorus team, Paul, to you and the Nebraska med team, thank you for all the work that you guys have done day in and day out during COVID-19, before, after, um, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I see that as something no different than we see how first responders are thought of post 9-11. I think 
and that changed how people viewed that for those professions. I think this is going to increase people's appreciation for that medical community even more. I hope it does. And I hope, I hope people also realize that, you know, in addition to the people we think of as healthcare workers, the doctors and the nurses, there are people who are right there in those patient rooms who are cleaning up the rooms, they're in charge and, and disinfecting those rooms is a very important job right now. And people delivering food to patient rooms, um, people you know, doing respiratory therapy in those rooms, those people are right there. And I hope when, when everybody's talking about appreciation for healthcare workers, they're thinking of those folks too, because they are right there. And it's a brave thing to do to go to work these days. There, there's a, and one of my favorite books is a book called The Checklist Manifesto. And it talks about the value of checklists in healthcare and in hospitals. And it specifically cites that surgeries are only as successful as a person who cleaned the room prior to it. Yep. And all those processes that go into place. It's more than just the people with their hands on the patients. It's the entire team there that makes an impact. It is. And I, I, I can think of a couple of stories just right off the top of my head that I've been involved with here um, where some of those, um, the housekeeping staff, the environmental services staff made a real connection with their patients and they think of them as their patients. It's, it's not just the doctor's patient or the nurse's patient or um, the physical therapist patient. Those certainly are too, but those, those colleagues feel like that's my patient and they have a real connection with them, especially for somebody who's in the hospital for a long time. And it matters to that patient that it matters as much as, um, the relationship they have with the clinician. So it's a, it's a really good point. Absolutely. Well, the podcast is called Culture Comes and Cocktails, Paul, and we yeah. can end this on a positive note. We did there with the showing gratuity to uh, everyone involved, gratitude to everyone involved. Uh, so what is your favorite cocktail, Paul? And if it's not favorite cocktail, where to get your favorite cocktail? I'm an old fashioned man. Good man, good man. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of came late to the cocktail game, but uh, I was, I was in, um, in grad school a few years ago and we would frequent some of the um, bars in the downtown Denver area afterwards for happy hour after class was out. And uh, so one of my, one of my teammates in our, in our, in our group um, is an orthopedic surgeon. So I was, I was ordering something. I didn't, you know, I didn't know from, from Drake's I say gin and tonic and he he stopped the server at this at this bar and said no this guy needs an old-fashioned bring him an old-fashioned song <laughs> so that's 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 how the love affair with the old-fashioned started and it's a you know once once a week kind of thing keep it special it's yep. uh, but it's the simplicity of 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 a drink like that after a long week it's good now, the, now, there's nothing, I will say there's nothing wrong with a gin and tonic, but I do enjoy an old fashioned, even to the point where uh, we have since purchased our own cocktail shaker to do some other fancy cocktails. I didn't know one of those before, but we uh, are waiting on Amazon to deliver uh, uh -huh. one of those kitchen torches so we can burn the edges oh. of the orange for the, yeah. for the old fashioned. So in lieu of being able to go out and enjoy a nice cocktail, we're doing our best to try to do those here at, at home when, when it's right, like you said. Yes. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I made something. I mean, this is I may do myself by saying this anywhere outside of my own kitchen, but I, uh, <clears throat> I think it was a, it was a Thanksgiving a few years ago. And we had some friends over, and I, I was sort of playing mad scientist with, um, it's cherry, cherry or cranberry Seven Up. I think it's cherry Seven Up. Mm -hmm. Little vodka, little amaretto, and a lime. Mm -hmm. And I made the mistake of giving it a, a bizarro name. I don't even remember what the origin, but I said, this, this drink is called a cabana boy. Cheers. <laughs> so I made up my own drink. And every time my friend Carrie comes over, she gets a cabana boy. I, I think of, of the 30 plus episodes of none of this, Paul, I think you're the first one to bring about an original creation. So I like that. Really? Well, yes. well I, I didn't give away the secret, the, the ratios. So. Um, well, that, that's something to let people play around with. Let them figure that part out. That's right. Yeah. Be your own <laughs> mad scientist. And my wife's in the other room going, I can't believe he's talking about a cabana. <laughs> 
Paul, again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for all the work you and your team have done at Nebraska Med and be well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation and hope everybody is well also. If you enjoyed what you heard from this episode and want to check out others, find Culture Comes and Cocktails on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And when you do, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. This has been Culture Comms and Cocktails, internal comms served straight up. Thanks for listening.